Hi, and you're now with the Forerunner Chronicles. All right, everybody, so in the book of Job, the Bible presents to us a very interesting question which perplexes the minds of multitudes within our world today. And the question is found within Job chapter 14 and verse 14, where the Bible says, If a man dies, shall he live again? Now, it's only natural for human beings which experience death on a daily basis to be at least a little bit curious as to whether or not there's a possibility of life after death. And the Bible begins to answer this question in the book of John, chapter 5, and verse 25, where Jesus himself said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that the hour cometh, and now is, when they that are dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So the Bible is clear. All that are in the grave one day will hear the creative power of the voice of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and at hearing His voice, they will be resurrected from the grave. However, the Bible gives us more information about this, and we need to take note of it. It's found within John chapter 5, beginning at verse 28, where the Bible tells us, Marvel not at this, for the hour cometh in the which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice and come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So these scriptures clearly indicate that there are two distinctly different classes that will be resurrected from the grave that will receive two distinctly different rewards at the time periods at which they are resurrected. Class number one, those that are good. Their reward, the gift of life, obviously eternal life. And class number two, those that are evil, their reward, damnation, which is the punishment of the untempered wrath of God, which is going to bring about their utter destruction. Now, because none of us when we receive the punishment of the untempered wrath of God, which will bring about our utter destruction, the question we should be asking is, how can I be a part of the resurrection of those that will receive the reward of eternal life? Well, according to the Bible, that is a reward that will be given to those that are good. So what is the criteria that God uses to determine whether or not a man is characteristically speaking good? Well, according to the book of Romans, chapter 7 and verse 12, the Bible says, Wherefore the law is holy, the commandment is holy, just and good. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God's royal law, His Ten Commandments, are His universal standard, which He uses to measure the characters of men to determine whether or not they are good. And that same royal law, His Ten Commandments, which are good, they are also holy. And the Bible says, Any man that keeps God's commandments is declaring that they have a specific mindset towards God. The Word of God speaks of this in the book of 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. The Word of God says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. When we keep God's commandments by faith, we are revealing that we have a deep-seated love and gratitude for our Creator. When we give ourselves in total commitment to His service, we are proving to the world, we are giving a revelation to mankind that we do not esteem God's commandments to be a burden, but we look upon them as the source of our joy and our happiness because they bring us into communion with God as we walk by faith in Jesus Christ to do all that is pleasing in His sight. Matter of fact, God pronounces something about the characters of those that keep His commandments. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22 and verse 14, the Bible says, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Then in the book of Numbers, chapter 15 and verse 40, the Bible tells us that ye remember and do my commandments and be holy unto your God. So according to the Bible, Those who by faith in the power of God reveal their love and adoration for Him by keeping His commandments, God will pronounce them to be blessed and holy. Now I wonder, which resurrection do you think the blessed and holy will come up in? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God, and of Christ, and shall reign with Him a thousand years. So once again, those who by faith in God reveal their loving reverence for Him by keeping His commandments, God pronounces them blessed and holy. He raises them up in the first resurrection, and they reign with Him for a 1,000-year period. This is the great millennium. And you may be wondering, 
when will this first resurrection take place? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 16, where the word of God says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's at the second coming of Jesus Christ when the good, the holy, and the blessed will be resurrected from the grave, which is the first resurrection, to go to heaven to be with Jesus and reign with him for 1,000 years. And what about the rest of the dead? When will they be resurrected from the grave, the evil ones that receive the punishment of damnation? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5, which says, And the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Now notice something carefully. There's a thousand year time period that separates the resurrection of the two different classes. The first class is resurrected at the second coming of Jesus Christ, taken to heaven to reign with him for 1,000 years. And at the end of that millennium, the evil, the unjust, and the wicked, they are resurrected at the end of the 1,000 years. These are the two resurrections. And during this thousand year time period in which the saints are reigning with God in heaven, what will they be doing? Well, the Bible lets us know exactly what they'll be doing in the book of Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, because it tells us there, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So for the thousand year time period, the saints will be engaged in the work of judgment with Jesus Christ. And who will they be judging? Well, the Bible lets us know who in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 2. The word of God tells us there, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things pertaining to this life? According to the Bible, the saints will judge both the world and the fallen angels. And when the Bible tells us that the saints will be engaged in the work of judgment, this does not mean that they will be determining who will be saved or who will be lost. It is obvious that Jesus has already completed this work because the saints have received the reward of eternal life. The work of judgment they will be engaged in is determining the extent of punishment that all are worthy of receiving according to the works of lawlessness they performed during their lifetime. And speaking of lawlessness, what about those individuals that will be living when Jesus Christ returns to this earth for the second time, but when Jesus comes, they will be living in sin? What is going to happen to the living wicked? at the second coming of Christ? Well, the Bible begins to answer this question in the book of Luke, chapter 17, starting at verse 26, where the Bible says, And as it was in the days of Noah, meaning Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, fire and brimstone rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is clear. Every individual that refuses to repent of their sin, when Jesus Christ returns, they will have no place of safety, they will have no shelter, they will be destroyed at the presence of the Lord. All the wicked will be laid down dead. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, 
Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. There will be no place of escape. Men will be running into caves. Men will literally beg the mountains and the rocks to fall on them, to hide them from the presence of the Lord, but they will not escape the destruction that God will be bringing to the wicked. The Bible speaks more of this event in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25, beginning at verse 30, where the Bible tells us, Therefore prophesy thou against them these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that treadeth the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the end of the earth, for the Lord hath the controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. And then in Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 33, the word of God goes on to say, And in that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented neither gathered nor buried, they shall be dung upon the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, can you imagine that at the presence of the Lord, every wicked man, every unrepentant sinner, every person that refused to stop lying, refused to stop stealing, refused to stop fornicating, refused to stop being dishonest in every shape, form, or fashion, they will be laid down dead. This whole world from north, south, east, and west will be covered with the mangled forms of rotting corpses. And what will the earth look like at that time? In what condition will this world be in? Well, the Bible begins to tell us in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 4, starting at verse 23, where the Bible says, And I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and there was no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and his fierce anger. Oh, ladies and gentlemen. This world is getting ready to be broken down. All the cities thereof will be broken down. For the word of God goes on to say in Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 20, For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate. This world will become desolate. Even as the Bible said in Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 23, that when the prophet beheld the earth, it was without form and void. The word of God is letting us know that the world at that time will become to be like it was prior to creation. For we are told in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, before God made anything, that the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. When Jesus Christ returns the second time and redeems his people, he will render this world into a dark, chaotic state. It will be an absolute desolation, a vast wilderness of nothingness, an abyss of darkness. And where will the devil and his angels be during all this chaos? during all this destruction and mayhem that they are responsible for causing. Well, the Bible begins to let us know what will happen to them in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, beginning at verse 1, which says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. 
and he laid hold upon the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. According to the Bible, there is an angel that will come down from heaven, possessing the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now this key and this great chain are symbolic of two different things. A key in the Bible can be a symbol of authority. The Bible begins to give us this understanding in the book of Isaiah, chapter 22 and verse 22, where the Bible says, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Then in the book of Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19, the Bible says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Notice that the one whom is given a key by God possesses the authority to either open up or to set loose or to bind up or to close up. And we are told in Revelations chapter 20 that this angel that comes down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit, he will bind Satan for a thousand years. And what will he bind him with? Obviously, he's going to use this great chain. Well, what is this great chain? Is it big metallic bolts? No, the Bible lets us know what this great chain is symbolic of in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, beginning at verse 7, where the word of God declares, He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. The word heavy there in the original language means that he made his chain great. So when God places a great chain on you, it means that he has hedged you about so that you cannot get out. And the phrase hedged about means that God has fenced you up or placed you within a prison so that you cannot escape. Therefore, in Revelations chapter 20, that angel that comes down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand literally is an angel that has been given authority to place the devil in prison for a thousand years. Will the devil be in prison for a thousand years? Well, the Bible declares that he will be in the book of Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7, which says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. To be set free from prison, you have to first be in prison. And according to the Bible, the devil's going to be in prison for a thousand years. And what about the rest of the evil angels? What about the rest of the fallen angels that have been united with the devil since the very beginning of the great controversy on planet Earth to lead countless numbers of human beings into transgressing the law of God, thereby bringing destruction upon themselves? How is God going to punish them? Well, the Bible begins to answer this question in the book of Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 21, where the word of God tells us, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Now notice, the Lord is going to punish the host of high ones that are on high. This host of high ones are the same supernatural agencies which the Bible speaks of as being the ones that we are now wrestling against in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, where we are told, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. The spiritual wickedness in high places and the host of high ones are none other than the fallen angels and the devil himself that are collectively united in warring against the souls of humanity and they are the agencies whom God will punish. And the way they will be punished is spoken of in Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 22 which tells us, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in prison and after many days shall they be visited. Notice that 
the fallen angels, they are going to be gathered in the pit, the bottomless pit, with the devil, and after many days, which is the thousand year time period, they will be visited. The same way the Bible speaks of this event in the book of Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7, which says, and after the thousand years is expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. The bottomless pit will be the penitentiary in which the devil and his fallen angels will be imprisoned for the thousand year time period. Now the word bottomless pit comes from the word abyss. The same word abyss that is used in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 to describe the deep when the Bible says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. Now, this is speaking of this world in its darkened, chaotic state prior to anything being created on this earth. So when the Bible tells us that the bottomless pit will become the prison for the devil and his angels, this is letting us know that it is planet earth when it is rendered into a dark wasteland, a chaotic place that is filled with nothing but dead bodies after the second coming of Jesus Christ, that will become the penitentiary for the devil and his angels for the thousand year time period. Now you may be wondering, why would God make this dark wasteland of a world after the second coming of Jesus Christ into the prison for the devil and his angels? Well, I'm going to show you why from the Bible. Now remember, it is when God places symbolically a great chain about Satan and his angels that they are imprisoned in the bottomless pit. A chain is also spoken of as fetters in the Bible. Now, look at what purpose God seeks to accomplish by placing someone in fetters in the book of Job chapter 36 and verse 8, which tells us, And if they be bound in fetters and be holden in cords of affliction, then he showeth them their works and their transgressions that they have exceeded. The reason why God will bind them on planet earth is to show them their works. Right now, the devil and his angels are 24 seven engaged in thinking about and working out our destruction. But now, for the very first time, Satan and his angels will be forced to behold their works. They will be forced to consider all the pain and destruction, all of the sorrow and the disease, all of the mayhem and the death that they were responsible for bringing into existence as a result of their rebellion against the kingdom of God. And for the next thousand years, they will tremble with fear as they realize that when their time on death row is completed, they will receive the most painful, fiery judgment that God can hand down to them. And we are told in the book of Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2, that as the thousand years were completed, the prophet beheld a most wonderful sight. For the Bible tells us in Revelation 21 and verse 2, and I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven and prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. When the thousand years are completed, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, will descend from heaven onto planet earth. Inside of that city, the saints who had their sins washed in the blood of the lamb, cleansed from all defilement, they will be there. Inside of that city will be the tree of life. Inside of that city, there will be streets of gold that are transparent. Inside of that city, there will be Jesus in all of his kingly glory. It will be a most splendid sight to behold. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But then the Bible tells us, in the book of Revelation, chapter 20 and verse 7. And when the thousand years shall be expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea at the end of the thousand years. Satan's situation will change. The wicked dead will be resurrected. And in that great multitude, 
that numbers more than the sand of the sea, there will be military generals. There will be military strategists. There will be tanks and missiles and nuclear weapons, armor, piercing, artillery, everything that he could possibly need to wage a successful military conquest. He will have at the tip of his fingers and he will encourage all of the wicked resurrected to unite with him to try to take this city and to destroy Jesus Christ and the redeemed saints. But the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9, And they went up upon the breadth of the earth, and they compassed the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them all. There will be no battle. There will be a slaughter. All men that live the life of sin, every angel, including the devil, that was caught up in rebellion against God, all of them will feel the power of the fire of God. And the Bible speaks about this fire in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, where the word of God says, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God in the which the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Even the elements will be on fire. This world will turn into one massive burning furnace. The planet will become a lake of fire in which all sin will be consumed and removed from God's universe forever. But praise God, the Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. God is going to make all things new someday. Even the lion and the lamb will play together. No more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying, no more disease. Everything will be in righteousness. So as the Bible counsels in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Everything in this world is going to pass away. The only thing that will survive is a character that is made like after the character of Christ. I pray that you will possess the character of Jesus in that day. God bless you. As always, this is the Forerunner. And whether you like it or not, the truth is the truth. Thank <laughs> you.